Does this opening image for the video intrigue you? Frankly, I think it is rather surprising. Have you ever seen such a star? Certainly, I have not. Is it truly anomalous? Is this rare? What is it? Well, I dived deep down the wormhole to find the answers, and what I found was very interesting and educational. In my prior two videos, I was playing around with UV IR cut filters and generated a lot of images with the equipment setup I am showing here. There is nothing particularly fancy about it. The telescope is a Svibony doublet design ED glass 80mm refractor. The accessories and details are listed here as well. It is a good one-shot color astrophotography rig capable of taking some nice images. During the previous episode 22 video, I took many 30-second images of the sky around the blue flash planetary nebula shown here. And in the previous video, I zoomed into a few regions to compare the performance of the Zboni and Bader UVIR cut filters. In fact, I presented this specific data and slide in the last video. But what I did not show was a zoomed box on the no filter image, which is now revealed here on the bottom left of this slide. I purposely kept it hidden because I noticed this striking star anomaly that I wanted to explore further before I revealed the information. What these images suggest is that this star is putting out an incredible amount of infrared light, amounts that vastly exceed the level of emitted visible wavelength light. To me, this looks like over 95% of the light detected is actually outside the visible spectrum. Now, if you're an educated astrophysicist, you might be saying, yeah, so what? But I am an astrophotographer, and I have never seen anything like this before, or even suspected it was possible. I guess I never thought about it. I think as deep sky imagers, we use filters to create pretty pictures, and not as tools to study astrophysics. So we, as imagers, are not performing operations that typically reveal these kinds of phenomena during our usual imaging experiences. Unless you're like me, who likes to explore and tinker with these high-tech toys. But regardless, I was fascinated with this star and decided to learn more. My first thought was that it could actually be some strange optical artifact, and hence I wanted to rule that out. So I looked at all the no-filter subframes to see if it was in all the subframes or in only one frame. And as you can see here, it is diffuse but present in all subframes, so it must be feature of the actual star. Obviously, the first thing I tried to do was find this star in Stellarium to see what it could tell me about it. I took my zoomed image and compared it against that same region in the Stellarium sky simulation and found a matching star pattern. I think you can see that the five arrows show stars that align precisely with the stars in Stellarium and the red arrow identifies one that appears to be my candidate anomalous star of interest. After selecting that star, in the upper left corner it says nothing but star, which is not helpful, but it does give a magnitude, a BV color index, and celestial coordinates. So my only hope was to use the coordinates to search in a professional astronomy database to try to find more information. I learned that the J2000 reference coordinates are the critical coordinates to research any star, not the reference coordinates labeled RA Deck on Date, which corresponds to where that star is located that night during the imaging. Because of course, the celestial coordinate reference grid is constantly drifting due to the precession of the Earth's axis and actually other factors too. So, to identify celestial objects, one has to specify an exact reference date, which is usually when the last comprehensive sky measurement database was compiled. That was Julian calendar date January 1st of the year 2000. Now I know why those J2000 coordinates are actually reported in Stellarium. Okay, so I have the coordinates and it appears to be a red star. 
That is what I know so far. By the way, there are several different types of red stars that are all candidates, and they are listed here from orange to red to brown dwarfs to red giants and supergiants, and even late stage lifespan carbon stars. So there were still many candidates. At this point, I needed the help of someone more knowledgeable, like my elder brother, Phil, who has formal education in astrophysics. Together, we explored two databases using the J2000 right ascension and declination coordinates that we got from Stellarium. First, we searched the URSA NASA IPEC Infrared Star Archive. These data come from the infrared astronomical satellite, which was put into Earth orbit at 900 kilometers altitude in 1983. This database immediately identified a likely star candidate, but the coordinates in this professional database were not an exact match. It was off by more than one minute in RA and many seconds in declination. So I was not absolutely sure it was a true match with my anomalous star. There were also a lot of technical information provided, including an object nomenclature at the very top left of this slide, which also appears to be some kind of coordinates. Fortunately, the database provided an interactive star image application, and I could adjust and zoom that image and compare it to my photograph. On this slide, my photograph snippet is shown in the gray cloud and red box. It is aligned and oriented and zoomed to precisely match the background image, which was taken from the IPAC database. As you can see, the candidate star in the IPAC database precisely matches the anomalous star in my photograph, both of which are circled in red. Actually, I did this one more time with the Strasbourg Astronomical Data Center in France, just to get a secondary confirmation. I used the same J2000 coordinates. I extracted another database photograph. I matched and aligned it with my image. And I, again, got a confirmation on the exact same object. It was designated as IRAS 20227 plus 1928. And also here on this data page, it specifically says a long period variable star. Well, now we're making progress. But I was disappointed that I could find no specific information regarding the star type, spectral classification, or other common data. However, I guess it is not surprising because this is a 15th magnitude star and there are literally millions of them in the database but at least I had a lead. It was a long period variable star. So what is an LPV star? This information was easy to find on Google. It is any intrinsically variable star whose light fluctuations are fairly regular and require many months to several years to complete one cycle. They are, without exception, red giant and red supergiant stars. That's cool. Figuratively and quite literally, I guess, we are dealing with some kind of red giant star. So, red giants are very low in temperature, very low density, and their light emission profiles, as shown in this slide, demonstrates a high level of infrared relative to visible light. It all makes sense. On this rather complex slide I assembled is a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram showing star types, temperatures, spectral types, etc. It even shows BV color indices along the bottom. And if you recall, Stellarium gave this star a color index of 0.95, which puts it well into the red class, and in fact, very close to Antares and Betelgeuse in this graph. On the right, I included a graph showing monochrome quantum efficiencies versus wavelength data from a typical astronomy camera imaging sensor. It illustrates that these camera sensors can pick up IR light all the way up to about 1,000 nanometers or one micrometer in wavelength. This is a very significant amount of infrared and why UV IR cut filters are frequently used in astrophotography. 
Three images of my anomalous star are shown in the bottom left here. On the sensor graph, I would estimate the light emission profile of my anomalous star would look something like this. I just drew this to show that the IR light is much greater than the visible light. This is not real data, it's just my casual speculation. But there are real data available. In fact, you saw it earlier on the IRAS database website. So let's look at it closer now. It is my understanding that each of these data points come from measurements using specific bandpass filters. You can see the peak of this emission graph is at around 1.65 micrometers in the infrared, which actually is the same for all typical red giant stars. Also notice the y-axis on this graph is an energy output measurement in logarithmic scale. The vertical distance between the peak infrared output at 1.65 and the highest visible light output is more than one order of magnitude, maybe somewhere between 20 to 50 fold higher infrared energy output. That makes sense. It is consistent with the visual anomaly we have seen in my photographs. For fun, I also looked up Betelgeuse on the IRES website database and have included its emission graph here for comparison. As you may know, Betelgeuse is the subject of intense interest recently due to its behavior and likelihood to go supernova in the not too distant future. It has a BV color index of 1.52, which is even higher, more red, than our anomalous star of interest. The Betelgeuse graph looks similar with the same peak wavelength in infrared at around 1.65 micron, as expected because it is also a red giant star at a similar temperature. However, the total energy output levels appear much higher for Betelgeuse as judged by the unit scale on the y-axis, probably because it is a much closer star. But interestingly, the proportion of infrared is not that much more than the visible light energy output. In fact, it is less than one order of magnitude more. Whereas our anomalous star on the left has IR energy levels greater than one order of magnitude. I am sure that means something to an astrophysicist somewhere, but that is as deep as I want to go for now. Okay, let's summarize. Fact. This is a long period variable star. Fact, it is a very cool red star, probably between 1500 and 3500 degrees Kelvin. Fact, cool stars emit much more infrared light. Fact, this is a red giant or a red supergiant star. Fact, red giant stars are usually very luminous and can be seen at great distances. Speculation. Magnitude 15 is very dim and suggests it's either very distant or somewhat obscured by interstellar dust or both. And remember, infrared light is less affected by interstellar dust, which somehow factors into this ratio of visible versus infrared light being detected by my telescope. If this is a red giant star, its lifespan from main sequence through the red giant phase can take billions of years. If this is a red supergiant star like Antares or Betelgeuse, its lifespan from main sequence through the red supergiant phase can take only about 1 to 10 million years. But what I actually do know for sure is that this star is a long period variable star it is given the designation IRAS 20227 plus 1928. It is about magnitude 15, deep red in color, and it is either a red giant or a red supergiant star. Red giants are quite common among the stars visible from Earth because they are so bright, but they actually are quite rare in space, making up only about 1 in 200 stars. This is because the red giant phase lasts for only a small fraction of the star's timeline and only at the very end of its existence. Extreme supergiant stars like Betelgeuse are exceedingly rare. In fact, only a few have been identified in the entire Milky Way galaxy. 
That's all I have. This exploration was indeed a deep educational adventure for me, and I hope you enjoyed it as well. Thank you for your interest in astrophotography Japan. Keep your eyes open for image anomalies. They are part of the fun of astrophotography. And here's wishing you clear skies and time to enjoy it. My name is Paul Cheesejaw, and I am an astrophotographer. <laughs>